Nixon Podcast, everyone. My name is Jimmy Nixon. Today is January the 20th, and it is about 10, 20 p.m. And joining me from Austin, Texas, the Stat King himself, Michael Ween. What is up? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to episode 90 of the Raw Prospect Podcast. I'm doing well. I'm back on campus for my spring semester. Um, classes started on Tuesday. It's all going well. Hope everyone's healthy, doing well. And who doesn't enjoy this time of year in sports? We're, of course, in the thick now of the NFL playoffs with Divisional Weekend coming up here soon. Uh, we got NBA storylines flying around everywhere. The college basketball conference schedule is heating up. Uh, we got MLB lockout negotiations going on. Uh, we got a little bit of everything, and we're going to get to, I mean, college football transfer portal craziness. Uh, we have a lot on our plate, and we're going to get to that. But for today, episode 90, um, we're, of course, going to preview the four great divisional matchups that we're going to get, two on Saturday, two on Sunday. And then we're going to talk college basketball for the first time in over a month. Uh, so that should be nice. Uh, and we're likely going to split these two topics into two separate uh, videos, podcasts, whatever you want to say. So it'll make it more palatable uh, to you guys. So you don't have to listen to a two hour likely uh, episode. Um, so that will be today. We're excited to get into it. And from there, we should just go ahead and get started. Right, right. And um I'm really excited about what we have planned for the first topic of the day. Um, we're introducing a new segment that we're going to have every single podcast once a week. Um, and it's going to be called the prospect of the week. And what that is, is me and Michael will each choose a player from any sport that we may have watched during the uh, during the week. It could be from even like hockey or something that we may not even cover on the podcast. Just any player that caught our eye, um, maybe did something special, played great um, in their respective sport, um, and uh, had a good week um, as an athlete um, and show them in the spotlight. Um, and we just thought that this segment would be a good way to uh, kind of lean into our namesake, which is the Raw Prospect Podcast. So um, with that, we will begin by me giving my first ever prospect of the week, and that's going to be Hideki Matsuyama. Uh, this week's winner on the PJ Tour um, won the Sony Open. Uh, that makes it his third win in the last 12 months. Obviously, he won the Masters last year, and then he won the Zozo Championship in his home country of Japan. Um, and it also makes it 13 straight tournament rounds in the 60s, the longest current streak on tour. So he is on fire. And um, not only did he win this week, but it was a fantastic win. Um, some of y'all may not have watched it because obviously there was NFL football going on. But um, while the NFL was on, uh, Hideki made, mounted a huge comeback on the back nine. Uh, versus Russell Henley. Russell Henley uh, came out on fire, um, started with a two-shot lead, and then shot 29 on the front line, on the front nine, extended the lead to five with an eagle on hole nine, and Matsuyama making a three-putt boat, three-putt uh, par on hole nine. And then from then on, Matsuyama mounted a huge charge and then won on the first playoff hole. Um, which was just incredible to watch. Um, so um, Matsuyama, I just wanted to highlight him because he's cemented himself over the past 12 months as one of the best players in the world. And um, he's looking to uh, repeat at Augusta this year, which will be really interesting to see. He's playing really good golf. Rightfully so. He was one of the guys I considered, actually. Um, we almost had the same guy. Uh, but I didn't. Um, I didn't do a whole lot of prep for this episode. I did a little bit of thinking. I thought about, you know, I, if you don't know, if you're new to the podcast, I watch a lot of college basketball. So I could have chosen a guy, uh, some guys that I was considering. 
uh, in college basketball. Of course, um, watch NFL on the weekly. Um, there's some NBA performances that have been notable as of late. Um, but I went with a great story. Um, my, pro my first ever prospect of the week. Oh, and by the way, I should mention, not to go on too many tangents, that we're going to be um, extending our coverage greatly of golf uh, here in the near future. Um, right. But you, you'll see that uh, down the road. Um, but for my prospect of the week, first ever, um, I went with a great story uh, in the NFL, uh, returning from an Achilles injury, tearing his Achilles in July, uh, right before training camp, running back, second year, young, talented running back from the Los Angeles Rams, Cam Akers, made his return, a historic like five month recovery from an Achilles injury to play in last weekend's wild card game or in Monday night's wild card game against the Los Angeles Rams, had over 90 yards from scrimmage. And I know a lot of people don't like to speak in like hypotheticals. This could have been, uh, this should have happened, whatever, whatever. But if it weren't for, you know, a couple penalties and a drop pass, he could have had near 200 yards from scrimmage in his first game back from an Achilles tear. And he obviously had a great impact on what that Rams offense was able to do. And he will be a big part of this Rams offense moving forward. So I just thought that was a great story. It was good to see him back on the field and amazing what he was able to do five months removed from uh, rupturing his Achilles. So that's my first ever prospect of the week. So this will be a weekly segment now and we'll be choosing athletes that we think should be highlighted from every sport imaginable uh, hopefully so that every sport gets recognized since we are a sports podcast right exactly um and that that was definitely a really good pick he made his presence felt for sure in that uh huge playoff win for the rams and we'll we we will talk about him uh later on in the show when we get to that game uh with the rams and the bucks but um, to start out our coverage for divisional uh, weekend, we'll start with the order uh, that the games will go in. So that would be the Bengals and the Titans, I believe, first up. Um, so I'll, I'll let you start off here. Right. So this is, well, first of all, we should highlight what happened last weekend. The Bengals, of course, got the monkey off their back like we predicted. They defeated the Las Vegas Raiders at home for the first playoff victory in 31 years. And they now travel on the road um, to play the number one seed in the AFC, the Tennessee Titans, who should be getting Derrick Henry back from his injury this weekend to play this game. Um, the spread opened at three and a half, Titans minus three and a half for this game. Um, I do think that given Derrick Henry's return uh, and some of the injuries that Cincinnati suffered on that defensive front in the, uh, in the Raiders game, uh, we know Trey Hendrickson, their, pat, their best pass rusher, 13 and a half sacks this year. Uh, he suffered a concussion and he'll play, which is good news for them uh, on Saturday. However, Larry Ogunjobi, a big part on the interior of that defense, and Mike Daniels, another big part on that defensive front, uh, will likely be out for this game. So two uh, key interior pieces will be out for the Bengals, and that's going to be key in the running game. Um, for Tennessee, um, of course, we've seen them. They've been a staple in the AFC playoffs as of late, ever since Mike Vrabel uh, took over as the head coach, Ryan Tannehill, solid quarterback. We've seen him take him to the AFC championship and they're going to have all the pieces together offensively. Julio Jones, AJ Brown, Derrick Henry. Um, and that's when this offense has been at its best. Um, I believe they averaged like two more yards per play 
in the very few snaps that all three were on the field together, Julio Jones, A.J. Brown, Derrick Henry, than when any one of them were out at any one particular time. So a big difference here in this offense. Um, I do think Tennessee is going to win this game. However, I do think the matchup to watch is this Bengals passing attack, which has been lethal as of late, uh, with Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, um, of course, the tight end, Uzama, uh, and others um, against this Tennessee passing defense uh, that still isn't great. Um, both teams are pretty solid in stopping the run. I do think that given the return of Derrick Henry and their staple of running backs and just the physical style of play, I do think Tennessee will be able to generate more of a running game than Cincinnati will. Tennessee has been very good against the run uh, this season. Uh, but I just think it's got to be on Joe Burrow. And I think eventually um, the pressure is going to get to him. Um, I think Cincinnati has had a great season. They won the AFC North. They won their first playoff game in a couple of years, but they've never won in their history um, a road playoff game. So I think the Tennessee pass rush will get to Burrow. I think they'll generate more of a running game, and I think they'll do enough in the secondary to squeeze out a win. Now, would I be surprised if it's close? Would I be surprised if Cincinnati pull off the upset? No, uh, because I do think Burrow's the better quarterback, um, and you know they've been the better offense as of late down the stretch of the season. However, I would take Tennessee to win the spread. I might take the Bengals to cover. Um, I think that would be the smart play. However, off a bye in his career with the Titans, uh, Mike Vrabel is 4-0 off a bye, uh, beating teams by an average of 20.5 points per game. And he's 2-0 as an underdog and 2-0 as a favorite against the spread. Uh, so take that for what you will. So my official pick, Titans to win but Bengals to cover. Okay. Um, for me, I did, I did a lot of prep on this game. I was really excited to cover this game just with um, the differences in styles of football these two teams present and bring to the table. Um, so I split it into two parts. Uh, Bengals versus the Titans defense and Titans offense versus the Bengals defense. So starting with the Bengals offense, um, it really comes down to whether this Titans pass rush can get to Joe Burrow. Um, that's really what it comes down to. Jeffrey Simmons, Nico Autry, Harold Landry, they've got to get it done. Um, and they've got to be able to get pressure on Joe Burrow with just the front four. Um, but let me give you some context to just how good Joe Burrow has been uh, over the past month and a half or so. Um, there has been only 11 quarterbacks in NFL history with uh, a passer rating of over 100 with zero interceptions in five consecutive games. And Joe Burrow, um, uh, and of the quarterbacks on this list, Joe Burrow has the second highest yards per attempt or um adjusted yards per attempt so depth of target um of any of these quarterbacks on this list and and these are some of the best quarterbacks to ever do it um so joe burrow is really in elite company um and joe burrow and aaron Rodgers are also the only to have a current streak as well um but back to my point um, it just comes down to the Titans pass rush. Um, you know, the, the Bengals offensive line, they have been um, actually playing okay the last few games. And Joe Burrow has, you got to give him credit. He's been really, um, really, really good moving around in the pocket. I love how he keeps both hands on the ball. He's very fundamentally sound. Um, and when he moves up in the pocket, he never puts the ball in harm's way. He's always very safe with it when he, even when he's about, when he knows he got, he's about to get hit, he covers it. Um, so I don't see Joe Burrow making a big turnover, a big mistake. Um, 
he's really cleaned up his interceptions. Um, and I think uh, Joe Burrow is going to have a big game. And I think the Bengals' offensive game plan should be very similar to what I said about the Cowboys last week. You got to win with the guy that brought you here. Um, same thing that I said about Dak. Dak wasn't able to get the job done, obviously, but um, I think for Joe Burrow, it's going to be it, around 40 to 45 pass attempts um, because this Titans defense, you're probably not going to be able to run a ball against them. Um, and your best matchup is in the passing game. So you got to take advantage of that. Um, on the flip side, uh, with the Titans offense, the Bengals defense, um, they had the uh, third fewest rush attempts against them uh, all season long. So uh, basically teams weren't running the ball against them for whatever reason. And that ended up making it seem like their rush defense was better than what it really is in reality they're giving up 4.3 yards per carry uh which is around 13th in the nfl which is okay but um i think obviously with what you said earlier with some of these guys in that front seven being out that's definitely something the titans can take advantage of um but for me the key is aj brown if you look at the games that the Titans had their most impressive wins. Um, the Chiefs game, the Colts game, the 49ers game. Um, in those three games, A.J. Brown combined for 20, 26 catches, 433 yards, and three touchdowns. Um, so when he gets going and he gets a lot of targets, this Titans offense it becomes entirely different because – when you get the ball in A.J. Brown's hands, he's similar to uh, a Debo Samuel in the way that he can break tackles in the open field and create run after catch yards. Um, and those are the explosive plays that they're going to have to have because um, I am expecting a pretty high-scoring game here. Um, so my pick, it's really tough but I'm actually going to lean towards the Bengals here. I, I just have to lean towards um, what I think is the more versatile offense and in, in, or better quarterback in Joe Burrow. And I just believe in that offense to make the plays down the stretch. Um, it's yet to be seen whether the defense can get enough stops. And obviously we don't know what Derrick Henry is going to look like. Um, but I think if you can – just take away A.J. Brown and make a Westbrook Aquina beat you, or uh, it feels weird to say, but make Julio Jones beat you. Um, he hasn't been himself this year, to say the least. Um, so make them go to other guys in the passing game and make Ryan Tannehill throw outside the numbers. He's a guy who's really comfortable working that intermediate passing game in the middle of the field. So if they can make him – go outside the numbers, he, he tends to have a, the um, tendency here and there to leave balls hanging inside when he does that. So uh, that's going to be a big key if the Bengals want to win. Well, you make some great points. I could definitely see the Bengals actually winning this game. And guess what? If they do, um, and I'm going to get to a couple counterpoints here in a minute, but if they do, uh, they would actually become – the fourth team in the past 13 seasons to advance to a conference championship game um, after finishing last or tied for last in their division the previous year. Um, the other three teams to do that, um, the 2009 Saints, uh, that was a while, while back. And then two teams did it in 2017, the year of the Patriots-Eagles Super Bowl with Nick Foles. Um, yeah, um, the 2017 Jaguars, after finishing last the previous year, got to an AFC championship with Blake Bortles and Leonard Fournette, as we all know. And then, of course, that 2017 Eagles Super Bowl winning team, uh, they got to the NFC championship game after finishing last in the NFC East the previous year. So if the Bengals do, in fact, win this game, they would become the fourth team 
in, in the past 15 years um, to advance to a conference championship after finishing last in their division the previous year. Now, with that all being said, I can see the Bengals winning this game. I do think Joe Burrow and the point you made about him, his pocket presence, uh, that I think has been the biggest, if not one of the biggest factors in his like steady, fast rise to a top 12, top 10 level quarterback, definitely down the stretch, the way he's been playing, the way he moves around and can extend plays now uh, within the pocket and outside the pocket, it's unbelievable. Um, and we all know that Cincinnati loves to throw the football down the field. That's where they hit you. They're a cheap play, big play offense. Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd. Um, they led the league in, um, I think, 50-yard touchdown plays this season, and it, it wasn't particularly close. I think Burrow had, like, 12 of his 34 touchdowns were, like, 40 or 50 yard plus yard touchdowns, which is just absolutely insane. Uh, but I just think in my mind, and I, I could definitely be wrong, but in my mind, I still consider this year um, to be a work in progress transition rebuild year for the Bengals. I still view their offensive line. It's gotten a lot better, but I still view it as a work in progress. Um, and I just didn't foresee this defense being what it is. Uh, I still think they can make some improvements uh, on that defense. But with their injuries on that defensive front, and with what I've seen from this run defense lately, um, they've actually given up 100 more yards against the run. Although they were good during the regular season, over the past six games, they've given up 100 or more yards on the ground um, uh, in five of their past six games. Um, so I just think with Henry, even if he's 75, 80% of himself, what he can give you along with uh, Deontay Foreman in that running game, the play action pass, I just think Tennessee is a little bit better, more well-rounded football team, a more experienced football team with a better coach that's proven it uh, than Cincinnati is but I could easily be wrong. Uh, I'm very, um, I guess, glad for Cincinnati's success. Um, and I think if their season ends Sunday, uh, people, in, people in Cincinnati and people all around football would be like, wow, look what they did this season. That was, this, this was a successful season. Um, so that's really all I have to say. All right, and I'll, I'll close out with this. Um... 10 out of 10 of the last divisional round games and 28 out of the last 32 playoff games. Um, the quarterback with the um, higher yards per attempt uh, has come out victorious. So um, if Joe Burrow comes out and dominates and t Tennessee isn't able to generate a pass rush, um, that's going to spell a lot of trouble um, for this Titans defense. Um, and I actually have one more stat that I forgot to mention earlier. Um, over the second half of the season, when the Titans don't blitz, the Titans have created pressure on just 26% of snaps. So that ranks 29th in the NFL. And they only rush the passer at a uh, second lowest in the NFL rate. So um, if they can't change that and generate a pass rush um, against this um, weaker than most Bengals offensive line, then it's going to be tough. But um, the way Titan, the Titans win this game is by being the tougher football team and by exposing this team in the trenches. So we will see. I think um, with the deferring styles, it could be a little bit lopsided at halftime for one way or the other. And then the other team will make a push at the end. I think it could, I could see it going like that because of how different these two teams play the game of football. Okay. That's really all that should be said. We'll yep. move on to the next game. Um, another team 
the other number one seed uh, in the other conference plays on Saturday night. Uh, the Green Bay Packers, who I viewed for most of the season to be the best overall team in the NFL. I've said that many times on this podcast over the course of the season. Taking on a team that I said a couple weeks ago and that we've said collectively that I thought would get into the playoffs when it was looking sort of up in the air whether or not they would. And a team that I said that could get into the playoffs and be a danger in the playoffs and win a game in the playoffs, maybe two games in the playoffs. And they've done that, the San Francisco 49ers. So we'll start with you on this matchup. What do you think? Um, well, it really is a incredibly intriguing matchup. I mean, you look at the last four matchups between these two teams and even just over the last decade their their matchups in the playoffs those years with Kaepernick um, going into Lambeau Field and taking them taking them down in I think 2014 or something like that um, but just these last four matchups we've had um, the Packers get punched in the mouth twice in 2019 and then obviously the injury riddled season for the 49ers last year the Packers took advantage of that and then the barn burner earlier this year in week three where Aaron Rodgers did Aaron Rodgers things in the last 37 seconds and led them down the field for a game winning field goal. Um, and I expect a game very similar to the one in week three. Um, this 49ers team is a lot better than they were in week three. If you look at, um, if you watch that game, you probably remember how sloppy the 49ers played. They went down 17 to nothing at halftime, I believe. Um, and they were really reeling a little bit. And they also didn't have Elijah Mitchell in that game. Um, their leading rusher was Trey Sermon, who only had uh, 10 carries for 31 yards. Um, so this is a different football team. They have uh, stronger corners in the back end. Um, uh, they had Josh Norman playing in that game, I believe, who's not even on the team anymore, I don't think. Um, so this is a different football team for San Francisco. And it's a tough matchup for Green Bay because now we really get to see if they've completely um, switched around their soft label um, in on the big stage. Um, they've kind of uh proven that they're a tougher football team throughout the season but um it doesn't matter if they come out flat in this game because the 49ers will punch them in the mouth no doubt about it um so for the packers i think a big key in this game might be the special teams game um the packers are 32nd in the uh in the NFL in overall uh, uh, punt coverage and kick return coverage. And uh, to start the second half, the 49ers actually had a really long kick return that sparked that comeback. So we could see something like that where maybe they throw Debo Samuel back there and he does Debo Samuel things, breaks a couple tackles, and then boom, he's gone, gone to the house. So um, – if the 49ers are going to win this game, they're going to have to get some kind of boost from their defense or their special teams to create short fields for this offense because Jimmy Garoppolo is not healthy, and I think they're going to really load up on the run. Um, so the 49ers need to be able to obviously run the football, and I think they will run the football, but um, – They've got to be playing a complete game to take down the Packers in Lambeau. It's going to be a tall task. Um, and then I look at, obviously, the offensive side of the football for the 49ers. I think Brandon Ayuk on the outside might play a really big role. Um, if you look at the way the Cowboys played the 49ers last week, it was a lot of cover one a safety in the middle of the field and then press coverage on the outside 
um, and then loading up in the box with eight on the line of scrimmage. Uh, if you're the 49ers, you can't let a defense do that to you. You have guys on the outside that can win. Brandon Ayuk has proven that. Debo Samuel has proven that. George Kittle has proven that. So um, Jim Garoppolo is going to have to take advantage of those matchups. And I think ultimately I'm going to take the 49ers to win this game. Interesting. I am hammering Green Bay. Um, okay. First of all, I've said all along, and I said this before, they're, they've been the best team this season. Um, and I still think that holds here. They're getting healthy. Jair Alexander, one of the best corners in football, will be back this week, along with David Bakhtiari on that offensive line. I think those two additions are huge. Anytime you can drop two pro bowlers uh, onto your roster, onto your team with a bye week, uh, it, it, it obviously bodes well. Um, I love what Aaron Rodgers has done. Uh, obviously, having another MVP caliber campaign, 37 touchdowns, four picks, hasn't had a turnover since mid-November. Um, you know, Zard Zadarius Smith could also return this week. He just returned to practice. I'm not sure if he'll actually play, but, you know, they're getting healthy. Uh, I do think they have the better quarterback, and they've been dominant uh, at Lambeau Field this season, 8-0 and at Lambeau Field, uh, and they were – Five and zero against playoff teams uh, from this season when Aaron Rodgers played. Uh, their one loss to a playoff team came to Kansas City, but in that game, if you remember, it was Jordan Love who played that game, uh, and they lost that game. Uh, now, I have also said that San Francisco—they're dangerous, they're physical, they can run the football. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, say what you want about him. But in crisis situations where he has to lead a drive, come back from a deficit uh, late in games, he's been really good um, for the most part. Uh, we'll forget about last week in Dallas where he threw the pick, kind of let, kind of open the door for the Cowboys to get back into that game. Uh, he does throw over the middle of the field a lot. You've mentioned this before, and that creates some, sometimes can, you know, um, that's where he struggles seeing linebackers in the middle of the field. Uh, he is aggressive, maybe too aggressive at times for his own good. And is not the best uh, uh, deep thrower of the football, uh, but he's three and one in the playoffs, um, been really successful. Um, obviously, San Francisco has had a history of beating Green Bay in the playoffs. I just think I like I like the matchup with these receivers of Green Bay, Lazard, Devontae Adams, uh, et cetera, et cetera, against the San Francisco secondary. I do think Green Bay can run the football. Um, and I'm not sure of the status uh, of Nick Bosa and Fred Warner. I do think that having both those players on the field, and I think there's a chance they might get those players back would be big for the San Francisco defense because they have to generate a pass rush. If they can't, then it's going to be trouble. But I just think Green Bay is the better football team. They're healthy. Um, the Niners, you know, coming on a little bit of a short week, uh, going to play in the cold weather at Lambeau Field, always tough. Uh, I'm not sure I would swallow. It's a big spread at uh, it's six. It's a six-point spread uh, in favor of the Packers. I would take the Packers to win, uh, but I'm probably leaning San Francisco against the spread. They've been really good against the spread this year, um, especially on the road. They're seven and three on the road this season. Their wins coming by over a touchdown on average, eight point one points per game, um, and of course, they're they're really dangerous. Uh, but I just think better quarterback, uh, favorable matchup on the outside with those receivers against the 49ers secondary. Still an ability to run the football with Aaron Jones and uh, uh, A.J. Dillon. Mm -hmm. And then a defense 
that's getting one of its best players back, maybe two of its best players back, playing at home after everything that's been said about Aaron Rodgers and the Packers in the offseason. I just cannot envision a scenario where they lose this game. Uh, but, you know, I just – that's – that's I. this is the one game where I cannot envision – an upset just because of the the circumstances and what's happening with the Screen Bay team and everything that's led up to this point. Um, but as we know, anything can happen. It's any given Sunday, any given Saturday. So I'll take Packers to win, but I'd probably lean San Francisco cover. Yeah, and it, it's funny you say that because um, as I was doing making my notes for this game. I was actually leaning more towards the Packers, but as I dove deeper um, and looked at um, what the numbers said about this Packers run defense and how that might match up with this 49ers run offense, um, I just think the 49ers are going to be able to control the clock, keep Aaron Rodgers off the field. And obviously, no matter what, if the 49ers are, want to win this game, they're going to have to win a close one. There's no doubt about it. They're not going to blow out uh, Aaron Rodgers at Lambeau Field. It's not going to happen. Um, so um, it's not going to be easy. And I, I definitely, of course, would see a lot of scenarios where Green Bay just comes out and says, we're legit. Put us on the map. Take us seriously. Um and just blow them out. But I don't know. I just have a weird feeling this 49ers team with the way their defensive line is playing, they're playing like they got rabies and they just fly around the field. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people were complaining about, you know, the blowouts of last weekend. I mean, Kansas city destroyed Pittsburgh, um, you know, Buffalo absolutely kicked New England's ass. Uh, Tampa Bay, for the most part, up until the fourth quarter, uh, kicked Philadelphia's ass. There were a lot of non-competitive games wild card weekend, and a lot of people were complaining about that. But, you know, as the NFL always does, it's still dominated ratings. Uh, over 102 million total people tune into wild card weekend, an average of 30.5 million viewers for each game. Um, so regardless of the blowouts, they still got the ratings and they still dominated television. Uh, but I think this weekend, to your point, which is why I'm taking these underdogs to cover the spread, even though I'm picking the favorites to win the games, uh, I do not think there's going to be a blowout this weekend. I think all the games are going to be highly competitive. Uh, and I'd be surprised if any of these teams won by double digits, two touchdowns. I just think these games are too good. Uh, these matchups are too good for that to happen. Uh, so all you complainers uh, who were complaining about blowouts and all this other shit, uh, just watch this weekend. Right, right. And I'll say this about the blowouts. Honestly, um, the Bills-Patriots game, I don't, I don't care what the score was. That was fun to watch. I mean, the way Josh Allen was playing, um, it was just a clinic. The way he tore apart one of the best defenses in the NFL. Um, if you love the game of football, I don't, I don't really see how you can not enjoy that. Um, obviously, if you're a Patriots fan, I get, I get it. But, um, yeah, I mean, Josh Allen, he just showed off his greatness on full display. Um, I mean, the other ones, yeah, the other ones were kind of eh, but the Bills one, um, I thought was pretty entertaining. Absolutely, absolutely. So now we move to Sunday. Um, our first matchup, the second NFC game, a uh, really good matchup here. Tampa Bay Buccaneers um, against the Los Angeles Rams. We'll start with you. Yeah, um, this one's really tough to pick um, because you look at the Rams, um, they've kind of adopted a different style 
since they've been in the playoffs. Obviously, it was one game, but um, it was pretty clear to me that they don't want Matthew Stafford throwing over 35 times. Um, they were they committed to the running game. They got back to getting him out on bootlegs um, and just getting it with the wide zone running game. And um, it's a very simplistic uh, offense. And in a way, if you know how to stop it, it it's stoppable for sure. Um, but it got the job done really well because they were able to mirror that running game with the play action and Arizona just had no answer for it. Um, this time around though, um, with Vita Vea in the middle of that defense, Nadam Kinsu, obviously not the guy he used to be, but still um, a very strong run defender uh, with those guys in the middle of that Tampa Bay defense and with how good they've been stopping the run all year with those linebackers. Um, I just don't see a path where it's going to be very easy to run against this Tampa Bay Buccaneers defense. So it's going to have to come down to Matthew Stafford's arm. Um, I don't think, I think they're going to stick with the run game and stick with him throwing under 35 times, but um, I don't think the running game is going to work. Um, and, and it might end up making their offense bog down a little bit. Um, Because you're going to end up with third and eights and third and tens when they stuff your running game on first and second down. So um, when it gets to that third down, can Matthew Stafford make those throws in the tight windows consistently and find his guys? Um, I don't know. I mean, he did it last week. He he played fantastic uh, last week. But uh, with – um, how highly I think of both defenses. I have to give the edge to Tom Brady in that department. Uh, but I will say this. Um, the fact that the weapons for the Buccaneers are down, that matters a lot because now you can load up on Mike Evans with Jalen Ramsey. Um, you can look to double a guy like Gronkowski um, in, off that line of scrimmage, maybe chip him uh knock him off his rhythm a little bit, knock the timing off. So if the Bucks don't win, I think it's going to come down to uh, these Ram, this Ram secondary locking down these Tampa Bay Buccaneers wide receivers and these weapons. Um, because if the defense for the Rams doesn't play well, they don't have a chance. I don't think I, I think, it's a tough matchup for the Rams offense and I don't see them scoring over 30 points. Um, so if it ends up being a uh, shootout, um, I don't know how well they would match up in that type of game, but good thing for them. It, I don't see it being a shootout and I think it's going to be around a 23 20 type of game. And um, even with that, I'm going to pick the bucks because um, I made the mistake last year picking against Tom Brady. I'm not going to do it again. Well, uh, this game's really interesting because eight of the nine, eight of the past nine NFC Super Bowl representatives have the NFC South or the NFC West. Um, so it's highly likely that the winner of this game could go on to the Super Bowl given that trend. Um, I agree with you. Um, I've tried to talk myself into picking the Rams, uh, given that a couple factors. Number one, the injuries on that Tampa Bay offensive line are concerning. Right. Losing Tristan Wirfs, who did not look right. He returned from injury uh, after, you know, hurting his ankle. I don't know exactly what it was. He just didn't look right in the backup tackle. I forget his name, struggled a little bit. And, you know, those Rams edge rushers could take advantage of that a little bit. And with miss potentially missing their center, Jensen uh, could also hurt when you have to consider, you know, Aaron Donald on the interior of that, you know, defensive line, this Rams defensive front. Given some of the injuries, you know, how do you beat Tom Brady in the playoffs? Will you pressure him uh, with your front four and your front seven? 
Um, so that's a little bit concerning. Number two is we know the Rams are really deep at wide receiver. Cooper Cup had one of the best uh, seasons for a wide receiver in NFL history. Um, they did lose Robert Woods uh, weeks back or months back. Uh, but they've been largely fine without him. And Odell Beckham, say what you want about his time in Cleveland and all the stuff that's been said about him. But over wildcard weekend, he was actually the highest graded wide receiver, of uh, any wide receiver during wildcard weekend uh, by pro football focus. Uh, and he's made an indelible impact on this uh, Los Angeles Rams offense. And that's fit in well, uh, better than I ever expected him to actually. Um, and then obviously a guy like Van Jefferson. I mean, they are really deep at wide receiver, even without uh, Robert Woods. And then you consider the running game um, of this Rams team, um, you know. So there are factors, you know. The Tampa Bay secondary has been susceptible at times when they've gone up against uh, better passing teams. Um some of the injuries in that secondary haven't helped, but still um, it's not necessarily the strength of their team. We'll say that. Um, and, you know, with these receivers and some of the injuries on that Tampa Bay offensive line and on the offense in general, it's been a bit concerning. But as you said, we'll get straight to the point here. Um, number one, you don't pick against Tom Brady in the playoffs, especially in the divisional round. Um, he's actually 14 and two in the division round. He's dominated the divisional round in his career, 12 and one at home. And this season at home, the Buccaneers went eight and one in Raymond James Stadium, winning those games by an average of 19 points per game. They were absolutely dominant at home. I'm not picking against Tom Brady at home in the divisional playoffs, a situation in which he's 12 and one in his career. Um, they're likely going to get one of, if not both, uh, Leonard Fournette and or Ronald Jones back in this game to go along with Keyshawn Vaughn and Gio Bernard, who filled in admirably last week against the Eagles. Um, I do think they'll have more success running the ball than the Rams will running against the Tampa Bay defense because that Tampa Bay defense are, is really good against the run. Um, number two, um, Look, I just think, uh, so that's number one. Number two, for this, um, what was I going to say? Shit. Um, I don't know. I just blanked. But Tom Brady in the playoffs, I don't care about the weapons. Gronk, Mike Evans, uh, I do think they're going to have one of the two pieces. I don't think they'll have Tristan Worse. I do think they'll have Jensen. That's what I heard earlier uh, in this run defense, making the Rams pass on third down, like you said, getting them into third and long situations. Uh, I just think they're the better football team, the better roster, a guy with 35 playoff wins, more than 28 NFL franchises as a whole against a guy with one playoff win. Um, I'm going to take uh, Brady and the Bucks to win. Um, but again, the Rams on their best days, uh, as I've been saying, can be anyone in the league. Question is, will they bring the A game? They have to pressure Tom Brady and, of course, find a running attack so they can work to play action. Uh, and the crazy part about it is Tom Brady is actually older than all of the opposing NFC coaches left in the playoffs. He's 44 years old. Sean McVay is 35 years old. Kyle Shanahan and Matt LaFleur are both 42 years old. So he's actually older than all his counterpart opponent coaches in the NFC, which I just found pretty crazy. And has a lot more experience than all those guys. Uh, so... They might not have Tristan Wurst, who's really good. He's an all-pro, uh, all-pro caliber tackle. Um, but they'll find ways to, you know, deal with that. And I just think 
they've been too good at home and you don't pick against Tom Brady in the playoffs. Now, what is the spread? I think it's Buccaneers two and a half or three. I'd probably, I'd probably lay the points. This is one of those I'd probably lay the points. Yeah, and with the injuries to the Bucs, I actually think the Rams do have the better team. Um, but um, how many how many times have we said that in a Tom Brady playoff matchup where the other side has the better team, but Tom Brady's just able to overcome it one way or another? Um, um, as you said, I do think the Bucks running game is going to be really important. Um, I believe they ran for under 50 yards in the last matchup. Um, they didn't stick to the running game at all. Brady threw for um, a ton of yards, but um, ultimately the imbalance of the offense really did them in. So the running game is going to be huge. Getting Leonard Fournette, Leonard Fournette back is going to be really big. Um, so – I don't know, man. I'm going to be cheering for the Rams just because I want to see somebody new in the Super Bowl. But um, in my gut, I just I just feel like I don't know if I can trust them to beat Brady if I'm if I want to put my money down. Right, and for me, and I know Brady's probably not done, not near done playing, uh, and Rogers isn't near done playing. But it's not often you get the opportunities to see a Brady and a Rodgers uh, play in an NFC championship game. So if my predictions come to fruition, hopefully we can see that next weekend. But anyways, we'll move on ahead to the last matchup of divisional weekend. Um, some would say at the beginning of the season that this would be the AFC championship game, uh, but it um, turns out that it's in the divisional round. Um, Kansas City, who blew out Pittsburgh last week, and Buffalo, who blew out New England last week. Two divisional winners going up against each other, a rematch of the AFC Championship game. We'll once again start with you. Yeah, this one is without a doubt the game of the week, and it's the matchup that We've been waiting on all year in the AFC. Um, obviously, we got the original matchup with these two teams in, what was it, week four or something like that? I remember it was early in the season uh, in that game where the Bills actually went into Kansas City and actually took them down. But Kansas City was a different team back then, plain and simple. Um, they picked up Melvin Ingram. Uh they moved Chris Jones back into the middle. Uh, Frank Clark has gotten back to being himself, playing at a high level. Um, and these linebackers, Nick Bolton and Willie Gay, have been really good, um, wreaking havoc, um, defending the run game well, um, learning on the fly, becoming better as better as the year has gone on. Um, and we've seen them develop right in front of our eyes as well. Um, and this secondary, um, as they have been in years past, has been the strength of this defense. Um, obviously, Daniel Sorensen struggled to start the year, and um, I believe he's not starting anymore. I think he only comes in on dime or nickel package, packages now, I believe. Uh, but still, uh, the combination of these two cornerbacks uh, and Tyron Matthew and these guys on the back end has been really, really solid to close out the season. Um, so just a completely different team. Even with that being said, though, Josh wow. Allen's going to get his. I think he's improved as a quarterback a lot. He's been through a lot this year. Um, and I think, unlike last year, the Bills – are playing their best football at the right time. They're peaking at the right time. And that really bodes well. Um, the question mark with the Bills all year has been, are they going to run the football? And can they run the football? Um, obviously, two very different things uh, because they showed in the last part of the season and in that playoff game against the Patriots that they absolutely can run the football. 
and they were very effective uh, against the Patriots. Um, so I think uh, with the Bills offense being slightly more balanced, it's going to make them that much tougher to stop them offensively. And then you look over to the other side um, with the Chiefs offense. Obviously, uh, Travis Kelsey has been fantastic down the stretch. Um, uh, Tyreek Hill, obviously a stalwart on this uh, passing game. But to me, the difference in this Chiefs offense has been they're getting the other guys involved more. McCall Hardman has developed as a route runner. They're getting him involved in the passing game. Byron Pringle. Um, uh, and that now they're four deep at wide receiver and guys that Mahomes can trust along with Travis Kelsey. So that is an element that they definitely did not have last year. Um, so on both sides of the ball, you end up with um, two teams that offensively match up very well against these defenses. Even with these defenses being very, very good, these offenses are just elite, best of the best caliber in the NFL. Some of the best, de- some of the best offenses uh, we've seen uh, in a very long time, in my opinion. Um, so I expect a very high scoring game, um, back and forth affair all throughout. Um, and if I had to pick, I'm going to pick the chiefs, um, until further notice. I just, I think the chiefs have shown to be extremely clutch in big moments these past few years. Um, but I will be cheering for the bill just cause I want a new, uh, a new team in the Super Bowl this year. Um, so either way, I think it's going to be an incredible game. Absolutely. This is definitely one I'm looking forward to. Um, we'll start from a Kansas City perspective. They're the home team. Number one, in his career, Patrick Mahomes has been dominant at home in the playoffs. 20 touchdowns, only one interception at home in the playoffs. And that's, of course, how he's gotten to uh, two straight Super Bowls, been in two straight Super Bowls, won one, lost the other last year against the Buccaneers, and is looking to get to a third straight Super Bowl, which is absolutely unheard of in the NFL. Um, So um, depending on what happens in that Bengals-Titans game, he may have to go on the road for the first time in his career uh, in the playoffs um, to face the Titans if they do win this game and the Titans win. But if the Bengals win and they can pull this off, he'll, of course, be playing at home again next week. And now you mentioned – This Kansas City team, very different from what they were when they played the Bills and got absolutely dominated earlier this season. You remember, they were in the stretch of the season where they were turning the ball over a lot. A lot of uncharacteristic mistakes from Patrick Mahomes, a lot of fluky plays, turnovers. Um, I believe they had 19 turnovers as an offense in the first eight games. However, they only have eight turnovers ever since. Um, So they've really corrected their giveaway issue. Um, And if you look at that game, look back at that game, uh, Buffalo won that game because of the four turnovers that Kansas City basically gave them. Um, Kansas City isn't going to do that, I don't think, in this game. Uh, They've obviously figured some things out. They're not the – I mean, they can still beat you down the field. They can still hit you at any given time. They have that ability. They have the firepower and the explosiveness, especially when Patrick Mahomes is able to extend plays. We still still see that. Uh, But they've changed a little bit in terms of their identity. Mahomes is, you know, he's been better about taking what the defense gives him. And that's really – help this offense down the second half of the season, not turning the ball over as much, running the football pretty effectively, even though they've had many different running backs 
uh, in that running back room that have contributed um, to this effort. That's, I think, what a game ultimately like this comes down to. Either the turnover battle or maybe whoever gets the ball last. <laughs> That's what I think this game could really come down to. So from a Kansas City offensive perspective, continue what you've been doing. This is a Buffalo Bills defense that statistically was number one in the NFL this season in scoring 17 points per game, yards given up per game, and of course, they were really good on third down. Now, why do I bring that up? Because last week, uh, in that game against Pittsburgh, uh, in that first quarter, early second quarter, when Pittsburgh was having some success, especially defensively, well, what did they do? They forced two turnovers, and they got off the field on third down. They forced third and longs, and they got off the. They were able to find ways to get off the field on third down. That's how you beat Kansas City. You have to play solid third down defense, win the possession downs, third and fourth down, and find a way to create one or two turnovers. Now, does this Buffalo Bills offense need short fields? No, they don't. Um, they were actually the first team in NFL postseason history to score uh, touchdowns on their first uh, five possessions. Uh, they actually did it on the first seven possessions, but no other team in NFL history, NFL postseason history, had scored touchdown on their first five possessions in the playoff game ever. Uh, they did it on their first seven possessions. I do, I think, I do think they'll probably come back to earth a little bit against this much improved Kansas City defense and this pass rush of Chris Jones, uh, Melvin Ingram. Uh, you mentioned Bolton. I do think Willie Gay is dealing with some uh, off the field issues that he's gotten involved in. Uh, I don't know his status for this game, but regardless, it's a really good Kansas City front seven, and their corners are really good in press coverage. Um, so, from a Buffalo standpoint, as you said, it's all about running the ball. Uh, we know that they're a big swing offense, they're kind of they're kind of like Cincinnati. Uh, Josh Allen is always looking for the knockout punch, throwing the ball downfield, uh, extending plays with his legs. Uh, and he, of course, at some points in times, is a big part of the running game. Devin Singletary uh, and the other running back, uh, Moss, Zach Moss, uh, mm -hmm. we've seen them run the football effectively the past couple of weeks. Um, I believe they're averaging, let's see, yeah, over the past six games, they're averaging 163 yards per game on the ground. Uh, so that's really been the difference in this the this Buffalo offense. They're averaging 32.3 points over the past six games, and that's coincided with the success on the ground. I do not think they'll play as well, but as I said in the beginning, I think both teams will be able to move the ball. Red zone, turnovers, and winning third downs will be, I think, the difference. This will be um, my one upset of, of the week. Um, I'm going to take Buffalo to win. However, I see it going either way. But I'm going to have Buffalo and Tennessee in my AFC championship. And I'm going to have Tampa Bay and Green Bay in my NFC championship. Those are my predictions. I hope we get four really good games, unlike last week although those, those games were still really fun to watch. And this game is probably my number one uh, most looking forward to just because of what we think we're going to get with these two quarterbacks, these two offenses, and just the magnitude of what's going on right now with these two teams, um, given what we saw last week. So there you go. Yeah, and I'll close with this. It's actually like – a little bit of a dire note, but I actually, I think I can definitely see some ref ball happening in this game uh, at one point or another, always with games like this that are super high scoring where every possession matters. Um, a call here or there um, in like a pass interference sense or a, um, 
or roughing the passer or anything um, of that magnitude could change the game. So um, I'm not saying the refs are going to call a bad game or call a good game or whatever, but I think that type of call or that type of mistake could play a, a huge role in this game. Absolutely. We hate to say that officials could decide a game here or there and make a bad call that could play a big influence in deciding a game, but it's always something, always a factor you have to keep in the very back of your mind uh, when it comes to these playoff games. But anyways, um, that's going to do it for our NFL Divisional Weekend Preview. I think we're going to take a little break uh, and then come back for our college basketball segment. Right. Um, and I think I'll cut off the podcast right here. So um, if you're listening on Spotify, make sure to give us a five-star rating um, as well as on Apple or any other podcasting service. Um, I think we're going to continue to do this type of format where we maybe cut off on a certain topic and then start a new episode um, because I think It'll make the episode shorter, more palatable, obviously. Um, and I think it'll just help our overall product as well. Um, because the reality is some of y'all are going to want to watch certain sports more than others. So um, I think it will help in that respect as well. So um, as always, thanks for watching. Um, and we will see you with episode 91. Absolutely. And just like the Dallas Cowboys and Pittsburgh Steelers seasons, uh, for this episode, we are going, going, gone. Peace out.